In this video, I want to talk about capacitance and capacitors, the symbol, the structure, and the equation and definition. So let's get started. What exactly are capacitors? Well, capacitors are electronic devices and components, essentially, that are used to store energy in electronic and electrical circuits. So let's give an example. They're used in computers. They store energy in normal use. So normal use is when a computer is uh, connected to a plug that supplies the computer with energy, electricity, right? And then they gradually release this energy in the case of a power failure so that the computer operates long enough to save valuable data. Another example of this is when your phone battery goes out because it becomes zero percent. Now you might try to turn on your phone by pressing the power button, in which case the phone will show a little screen where they show you the battery icon and it says that's zero battery, phone cannot turn on, etc. But in order to show you that screen, they are using the LED lights in the screen. And that means that there has to be some sort of energy left in order for them to present that to you. That energy is probably coming from a capacitor, which stores energy. So let's take a look at the simplest sort of like structure of a capacitor. Now, this is what it is. It's essentially just two metal plates that are connected to leads. They lead them to a power supply, right? A cell. We can picture that. This leads to positive terminal. This leads to negative, and it's like that. So basically what these power supply, what they do is the metal plates have equal and opposite forces as a result of the cell giving it that. And then they are separated by a dielectric. And what a dielectric is, it's, it's an insulating material. So even though in, 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 as a result of the cell, this might have a positive charge, this might have a negative charge, etc. The charge will not flow through the insulating material. The charge won't flow through the dielectric because it's an insulating material. Now, that's essentially what it is. And we can also see it more commonly found in the spiral Swiss roll pattern. It looks just like a Swiss roll. And this is more common because it is rolled up together so that it has a more compact shape. You can see that it's exactly the same thing. It's just rolled up. So to move charges onto the plates of a capacitor, it must be connected to a voltage supply. This is the voltage supply in this case, right? And I think something important to talk about is this is the circuit symbol for a cell. This is the circuit symbol for a capacitor, as you can see right here. So they're very similar. The only difference is the stick lengths. So make sure to pay attention to the difference in the stick lengths. Now, the negative terminal, which is the shorter stick right here, will push electrons onto a plate. Hence, it becomes negatively charged. So essentially what we have is we have the negative uh, terminal getting electrons out. And you probably already know this. And it flows out into here. However, it stops flowing because there is a dielectric. So the electrons can't flow through anymore, which means that the electrons start accumulating on this plate. It's the same for the positive terminal. The positive terminal repels electrons from one plate, hence it becomes positively charged. Now we know that this is positive, so the electrons within the wire will be attracted to that and they will flow towards the positive terminal. Now that means that the electrons will keep being displaced from the charge, uh, this one plate, right? Because the dielectric prevents any other electrons from this side also going to the positive terminal. Hence, this loses electrons, making it positively charged. Now, the ammeters will give identical readings, meaning that the current is the same on both sides of the circuit. And the current stops when the potential difference across the capacitor is equal to the electromotive force of the supply. It is then deemed to be fully charged. So picture this for a moment. We have continuously um, a negative charge building up on this side, a positive charge building up on this side. And if you decided to connect a voltmeter across it, you will see that the potential difference keeps increasing. And that obviously makes sense. As the negative charge and the positive charge discrepancy increases, the electric potential um, and the intensity of it or the magnitude of it will also increase. The electric field between this, the magnitude will increase because of the fact that charges are continuously being built up. Let's say that this has an EMF of 6.0V. The closer we get to this 
potential difference being 6.0V, the less current will flow. And once these two are same with each other, the current will stop flowing, it'll become zero. So if you had a lamp connected to this, it will stop flowing, It would the lamp would not be bright, it will not shine anymore when these two are the same. Why? Well, that means that this is negative 6 or negative xq, right? Um, the charge is negative q. When this becomes negative q, there is no point in pushing the electrons from here to here because they both have the same charge. Um, you can't do it because if you were to push an electron here, the electrons would actually repel the new electron. Um, so basically they wouldn't move anymore. So that's why the current will stop flowing if the potential difference between the capacitor and the EMF, they all both equal each other. And the EMF is for the cell, right? And the potential difference is for the component in the circuit. A capacitor with uncharged plates, so you didn't connect it to any sort of circuit yet, they have equal amounts of positive and negative charges on each plate. And what that means is you just have a plate, you know, this is your dielectric, and then that's another plate. In this plate, let's say you have three electrons, you will also have um, three positively charged ions, right? So you're going to have this equal out, and it's going to equal to zero. The overall charge on it will be zero. Now, when it is connected to a supply, the supply does work in separating the charges from negative Q to positive Q because, well, work is distance times force and they are moving in a distance, right? So then the two plates have an equal and opposite charge. Now, the overall total charge in the capacitor is still zero, which is equal to this, the initial thing. You know, initially you have zero Q, zero Q, zero Q. And then, you know, once it's charged, it has negative Q, positive Q, but the overall is still zero Q. That doesn't change. You add this together, you get zero. So the charge stored by a capacitor is Q, the magnitude of the charge stored on each plate. What does that mean? Well, if we have a capacitor and then, you know, one side has negative Q, that's the charge. One side is positive Q. When we want to talk about what is the charge stored, well, that we just use as the magnitude. And, and you might be a little confused because actually the difference in the quantity of charge between these two is actually 2Q. For example, if we had you know, uh, maybe positive 3 coulombs and then negative 3 coulombs, what we put at this, as the charge stored would be 3. 3C is the charge stored. However, the difference between these two is actually 6 coulombs. Well, why we have to put this like this? There's a reason. If you were to take a charged um, capacitor and you were to connect it to a device or something, like a lamp, the electrons will flow from the negative plate to the positive plate, right? They will start doing that until they reach a point where both have the same charge. In this case, they will do it until they reach zero, zero Q. No charge difference for both, right? In order to reach zero Q, this has to increase by Q. This has to decrease by Q. So overall, the charge that flows to get through this to this common point is actually just Q. And that's the reason why we say that the charge stored by a capacitor is Q, the magnitude of the charge stored on each plate, and don't look at the difference between the two plates or something like that. In order to make the capacitor store more charge, we have to need to get a supply with a higher electromotive force. I think this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, the charge will stop flowing when the electromotive force equals potential difference. If the electromotive force is higher than the potential difference, that the final capacitor will have is going to be higher, which means more charge has flown into the capacitor. Now, if you connect the le leads of the charged capacitor together, just like I did with the lamp, right? Essentially, the lamp isn't any sort of like battery or cell. It's just like connecting the leads together. Electrons will flow back around the circuit from negative to positive. Remember that, you know, protons can't move. It's the electrons that are moving. And the capacitor is discharged. That is the terminology for it. 
Now, connecting an LED lamp to this would show the discharge. It would glow briefly, and this shows that um, the charges are actually flowing, right? There's an actual current within that circuit. In any given circuit, the current that will flow past a point in a given time is equal to the area under the current time graph. The magnitude of the Q on this can also be measured in this way. This is very straightforward. It basically just means that if you had a time versus current graph, and it was like that, if you integrated this and you got the area under the curve, you would get how much charge has flown through it. This is really just straightforward. Current is charge divided by time so basically if you times you know how much time it took then you're going to get the q so i think that's pretty self-explanatory finally let's talk a little bit about capacitance in general the capacitance of a capacitor is the charge stored on one plate per unit of potential difference between the plates what does that mean well we know that capacitors are going to move charges onto one plate and take them off one other plate, right? So for a given V, and let's say we have two different capacitors, I'll make this one like narrower or something, and they are both different capacitors. Now, let's say for the same V, one capacitor can store even more charge. One capacitor can store less charge. Maybe this capacitor is much smaller. Well, the capacitance is therefore the how much charge you can store per voltage or per voltage of potential difference. So the capacitance denoted by C is Q over V. Now, there's something a bit confusing here. We know that the unit for this, for the charge, is coulombs, right? However, the representation of capacitance is capital letter C. So I thought that was a little bit of a uh, pretty confusing thing to point out. In this equation, we're not talking about the units. We're talking about representing these. However, if you were to go into units, you would get one capacitor unit is a farad. We're going to talk about that a bit later. And one charge unit is a coulomb. And one voltage unit is a V. So that would be the unit equation. This is just the simplification of these letters or these words right yeah side note is that this isn't only capacitors that have capacitance any object can become charged by connecting it to a voltage the capacitance is then the ratio of the charge to the voltage c over v even you can have a little bit of capacitance if you got charged there might be a difference um in terms of like the charge on one part of your body and another part of your body so that would make you also have capacitance as I talked about, the unit of capacitance is called the farad, and it is represented by a capital F. Don't get confused with the Fahrenheit F. I think it's pretty easy to tell them apart in terms of context. So yeah, one farad is one coulomb divided by one voltage. C is used for both capacitance and coulomb. However, this is used for the word capacitance. This is used for the unit of Q which is, that's the word for charge, right? A farad is a large unit, and usually um, farads are measured in terms of like millifarads, even microfarads sometimes. Usually you don't come across one whole farad. Now, other markings on a capacitor might be the highest safe working voltage, which means that there's a limit to the um, magnitude of the voltage that you can connect it to, right? If it's too high, then the charge can actually leak between the two plates through the dielectric. And that means that the dielectric will cease to be an insulator. And so it's not going to charge, like it's not going to store the charge. It's not going to store some energy because it will just leak through it. Some capacitors are electrolytic capacitors and they need to be connected a specific way. So you would have like, they would mark this is supposed to be on the positive side, this is supposed to be on the negative side, then you would need to um, connect that to the positive terminal and the negative terminal of a cell. So those are the markings that you might find on a real-life capacitor. And I think that is about it for our chapter on capacitors, capacitance in general. Um, I would really recommend 
uh, checking out my channel for different videos that I will also post on capacitors. The next videos that I'm about to post include energies in capacitors and another one will also be capacitors and circuits like parallel, series circuits, how they're different from resistors and how what happens if you connect two capacitors together, etc. So do keep updated for that and if you enjoyed this video then do check out my channel for different physics videos that I posted on the same topic and level of difficulty. Thank you so much for watching.